you know, uh, and also many others in the IT sector. He has also been there for public uh, uh, institutions. In fact, one of the institutions with which he has done is a commendable job is uh, with the nations for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, persons with intellectual uh, disabilities, NIPET. In fact, we are doing a, a course uh, along with them for uh, to be offered to all the graduates and the postgraduates to sensitize people. He has done quite a good uh, things on this. In fact, that is very laudable because I find uh, uh, some of these are, uh, you know, uh, are uh, very useful because uh, they 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 help the uh, differently abled people. In fact, uh, uh, he has produced a, a kind of a, a film uh, in order to train uh, the deaf and blind children. This was done for uh, Helen Keller Institute. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, this is located in Boston and. Uh, in fact, uh, he has traveled widely, and then uh, uh, he had, uh, uh, you know, Rasky and other kind of organizations. He has been there, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, he has also been of the urban, uh, yeah. you know, British uh, uh, yeah. uh, he, In fact, uh, uh, he he has been quite active in. Uh, uh, in, in, in influencing the urban uh, sector services uh, and many of many of the municipalities or many of the uh, uh, you know corporations and even governments he has given logistical support and also produced some kind of uh, uh, he has been uh, consulting uh, them and he has produced uh, many uh, kind of uh, documents for them as well as documentaries and he has uh, in fact, uh, is also into uh, that is apart from uh, these activities, is also into public service uh, with uh, Rotary International. In fact, uh, I from childhood I used to know because my cousin was a Rotary president and secretary, and then he was also one. He traveled uh, to Montreal uh, and other places on account of that, and uh, he uh, has uh, been. Uh, part of uh, uh, CII that the, most of you would know because uh, uh, in fact the other day uh, there was a uh, Fiki is the other uh, group with whom they, have, they organize uh, conferences so he is one of the important uh, uh, members of this Hyderabad chapter in CII and uh, uh, in fact uh, I would not uh, go for longer because there's quite a few activities I skipped because uh, uh, Kartik himself, uh, in fact, more than anything, I think he has been uh, instrumental in uh, helping the government of India and by giving a good uh, talent of uh, civil servants through his uh, uh, association with the Braintree where he is a faculty. I know it's almost uh, uh, 90 Two onwards, I am, if I'm not wrong, he has been uh, teaching there. And then uh, I know quite a few of the civil servants who were trained by them, and he's there, quite a few of them are doing very well. And uh, and he is, with all these kinds of credentials that he has, he's a very simple and uh, uh, you know generous person. And uh, in fact, uh, his uh, uh, interest in anthropology uh, has not ceased. In fact, it has increased uh, his uh, gusto about anthropology and then he adopts it in uh, uh, many of uh, his activities. And uh, I, without taking much time, I request Karthik to take the mantle. Thank you, Karthik. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, at the outset, I should uh, thank you and Dr. Sunita for giving me this opportunity. I see uh, Professor Kamal Mishra, sir. Yeah. Uh, very good evening. and. Uh, Thanks so much for bestowing upon me this uh, honor to share my experiences with anthropology. I mean, it uh, 
really came as a surprise to me that you reckon me to be a part of you and that itself is a great honor to me. Thank you so much because I left academic anthropology uh, much longer. Good, very good evening, Sharma, sir. Thanks so much for being here. And uh, I am what I am uh, purely because of anthropology and all my gurus. Uh, I see them now. And in fact, uh, nostalgia struck me and uh, I was going through some old photographs, which I will be sharing on the HCU alumni group. Uh, and uh, I have been a student of uh, 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 Professor Kodan Rao, Kamal Mishra sir, Venkat Rao sir, Shiva Prasad sir, and uh, Dr. Sharma Garu. And uh, uh, 1990 and 92, those were the two years I spent in University of Hyderabad. I think probably the two best years of my life, I should say. And uh, it has really changed my uh, uh, the turn I have taken in my life, the journey that I have embarked on after passing out of the university is something that I am still traveling. Uh, 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 it's a continuing experience even today and uh, still would love to keep in touch uh, with anthropology. One is, of course, because uh, it's my raison d'etre, uh, whatever uh, little I'm able to do in training the aspirants of civil services. It's been 27 years now. I continue to teach anthropology and that compels me to be in touch with the subject, even though I left it academically a very long time ago. As you know, civil services uh, is very dynamic and uh, the nature of questions are pretty contemporary. And uh, so that compelled me to be in touch with anthropology, which I continue to do so. Uh, but uh, teaching originally began as a part-time. It's still, uh, for a very long time, it is a part-time uh, activity for me. I continue teaching anthropology because of the passion I have for the subject and the kind of the wisdom that uh, anthropology gives to the people who continue to be the humble students of that discipline. And it's an ocean. And you're never done with anthropology because every single day, a new vista, a new window opens up when you open the newspapers or watch news or come to know of the goings on anywhere in the world. And suddenly you recall something from your class or a book or a journal article that you must have read in theoretical or applied anthropology that you find extremely relevant to what's happening in the world around. So anthropology is more an experience. Uh, it's a way of life. And that's what I uh, call it. Uh, it's not just a discipline, but it's a way of life. It changed my personality. I'm sure it has done for most of you. And uh, we anthropologists, I always uh, keep telling my students, we belong to a different species altogether. And uh, even though we study the Homo sapiens, very proudly, I keep saying that we are the most sapient of the sapiens around is because we don't look at the world the way the people look at it and we don't perceive the things the way the people perceive it because we see the unseen we touch the intangible and we can make sense out of nonsense and that's what anthropology has taught me and i'm sure it must have been uh, your experience too and uh, i did my graduation in botany zoology and chemistry from Usmania university and then I was uh, attracted to anthropology because I had a, uh, an idea of, uh, you know, appearing for the civil services. And uh, in fact, I wanted to be a doctor, a medical professional. I'm passionate about the discipline, but uh, I didn't get a seat here in Andhra, but I got it elsewhere, but I didn't go for various reasons. But uh, I joined anthropology because it is a human science. And I was pretty much attracted to the, the, the kind of the uh, topics that were there in the discipline and took the entrance, joined the uh, 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 post-graduation course, and that's it. It changed my life forever. And I finished my uh, uh, training in Central University and uh, uh, I was honored to receive a gold medal from the university. And uh, I still remember the day when I had to leave the university. I was in tears. Most of us were. Most of my classmates continued to do MPhil. Some of them stayed back to do PhDs. 
Some of them are actually working in universities. Some of them have become heads of the departments. I consider myself very small uh, compared to all of them is because I haven't been uh, very much into the groove of academic anthropology in, in, in that kind of an academic ecosystem. But whatever little I have learned and whatever uh, uh, you know, or connections that I continue to maintain with the discipline are still uh, very much with me. I consider it to be a very sacred association that I have with anthropology, not because I teach the discipline. I don't want to find myself irrelevant in that domain, uh, but also because I found anthropology to open new perspectives in the various things I was doing in life. Uh, I, I am a filmmaker. Uh, I, uh, I have been working in both the corporate as well as the development sectors, both as a filmmaker and as a communication consultant. And uh, I have been working with administrative staff college again as a strategic communication consultant. And uh, I have been a Rotarian for the last 20 years and also doing my bit to the society in whatever little way I can. And also a father, a proud father of two children. And I see that anthropology is everywhere for me. Our dining table conversations still continue to be anthropology. Our early morning deliberations on the news and the news uh, articles is anthropology. Uh, I mean, as Amitabh Bachchan said in one of the movies, he talks English and he walks English. Uh, I mean, I talk, walk and breathe anthropology day in and day out. Uh, I would like to uh, take some specific instances that uh, where anthropology actually helped me, uh, uh, you know, uh, in my profession, the various activities that I keep doing. The reason I'm able to do so many is only because I am a trained anthropologist. The reason is because of that 360 degree perspective that anthropology opens up in one's mind and looking at the world in a very unique and a different way. I think that's what has actually helped me to carve a niche in whatever I was doing all my life. Uh, one of the reasons I'm able to deliver in my profession is because I'm consciously making use of the anthropological training that I have had. The methods that I have been trained in the experience of interacting with the humans, the communication, the importance of looking at the connections that exist in the society and culture, all these have really helped me enormously in carving a niche in whatever I do. I started as a freelancer right from my graduation days. I was freelancing. Uh, uh, you know, I was writing small copies for uh, other filmmakers. I was lending my voice to some of the films. Some of them approached me to write some uh, small scripts for advertisements. And uh, I started, I had developed an interest and passion in uh, the creative domain back then in graduation. But subsequently, I think probably the first uh, 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 tryst with anthropology happened when one of my students' brother, who happens to be an andrologist, uh, he was evincing interest to make a documentary on the importance of sex, sex education in India. And I'm talking about uh, 98 or 99. And that was the time when the film technology was not as sophisticated as today. Uh, everything has to be recorded on analog and magnetic tapes. And we had uh, uh, a very, today it sounds pretty primitive, but uh, you used to manually edit the films, cut a, a part, a portion of the reel and put it in another tape and make a film. It was a very laborious exercise. Uh, television was uh, uh, slowly, uh, you know, gaining prominence. And somehow I was uh, moving from one studio to the other to make various, uh, uh, you know, components of the documentary that uh, uh, I was asked to make. I actually teamed up with another filmmaker who had more experience with me. That was my first project. And while making that film, the research part of it was dumped on me. Uh, this man, this andrologist, 
uh, was giving me the technical information, but uh, uh, whether that particular documentary will be aired, uh, will it be ready for consumption for Indian television? Will it be accepted by the television channels as a documentary that is, uh, 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 you know, worthy enough to be broadcast were biggest challenges we had because uh, nobody was talking about sex and sexuality and sex education in India uh, almost 23, 24 years ago. But uh, we did it. Uh, it took a long time. So I was running from pillar to post and uh, somehow made a film and made a curtain raiser of the film. And then we approached a couple of uh, television channels. And very strangely, uh, one of the television channels actually offered me a midnight slot for that uh, documentary. And uh, that was when I was thoroughly disappointed because apart from the um, uh, the andrologist, even I was, I also sunk in a little bit of money I had in it. And I still had bills to pay to the studios that I have used. And I said the very purpose of making a documentary on importance of sex education is defeated when you give me a midnight slot because that, that was originally meant for, you know, enlightening the Indian masses of, you know, trying to be more, uh, open and uh, uh, aggressive in talking about sex and sex education with their own children. And uh, 20, 23, 25 years down the line, when I look back, uh, you know, it would have been uh, so important had we had this kind of an education on TV. Uh, because when you look at the kind of uh, the crimes uh, that are being committed by some animals that we live in our society with against children uh, against women and if, in fact even uh, uh, boys are not uh, you know safe from uh, sexual violence young boys are also not safe from sexual violence so in hindsight when i when i look at it probably i must have pushed it uh, probably i was a little anachronistic uh, to, you know to have done a documentary like that but uh, I don't repent because that was the first time when I saw that filmmaking and my uh, training as an anthropologist and this little wisdom that anthropology has inculcated in me actually crossed their paths. That's when I realized that there is a lot that I probably can bring to the table, uh, you know, of filmmaking by making use of whatever training I have uh, had. And, uh, and then the journey continued and, uh, uh, my, uh, I, my wife was actually under training in the then national Institute for mentally handicapped and, uh, uh, one of her professors who was actually heading, uh, the NIMS those days, uh, Dr. Jayanti Narayanan, who later on, uh, went on to become an advisor to UNESCO. And uh, uh, so she evinced interest in making a small film about NIMH. So my wife introduced me to Dr. Jayanti Narayanan and uh, I ended up making a small film. It was not uh, actually uh, uh, a commercial uh, activity, but uh, when I started discussing with her and the rest of the team at NIMH, uh, you know, uh, I was able to communicate. I was able to understand what they are talking about. And I was able to, uh, you know, make sense out of the need that an organization like NIMH, is, uh, NIMH had is only because again, uh, I was a trained anthropologist. So it was in one of those discussions that, uh, you know, it was uh, decided that uh, why don't we make an interactive multimedia training for the intellectually challenged. Those days, the word was mentally challenged. Uh, it's not uh, correct to use the word today. So the divyang, the intellectually challenged. So for the first time, uh, you know, we were working, uh, I had a multimedia lab. So I subsequently set up my own multimedia lab and a studio in Banjara Hills. 
and uh, we were experimenting with some multimedia codecs. We were doing 3D animations for films and television channels those days. And uh, uh, that was the time when we, I said, I broached and uh, uh, th uh, they accepted that let us do an interactive multimedia training for the intellectually challenged. And that started uh, my uh, uh, journey into, you know, that particular vertical of developing interactive multimedia software and working with some primitive tools. Those days they were pretty sophisticated, uh, working in uh, uh, programming. Uh, I'm, uh, I had very little exposure to programming, but I am an advanced systems management uh, diploma holder in NIIT. So I had a little bit of uh, experience in computer science. So we hired some professionals and we developed the India's first multimedia uh, interactive program for the intellectually challenged. And it was uh, a, a very long drawn process. It took about two to three years because that was when we, uh, we ha I had to do uh, field uh, work again and uh, taking the software uh, to the various uh, uh, places and sending it across India, testing it with the students and, you know, designing the graphic user interface uh, and, you know, uh, and making the software so uh, accessible to the people with various types of disabilities. And uh, uh, those days in CNN, you know, not the CNN IBN, but the original CNN channel featured us uh, and uh, that particular software, I believe, uh, was also sent to the Science and Technology Awards uh, by the President of India. I, I'm not sure about it, but uh, I was told that it will be sent. But uh, it started with that kind of an association with the intellectually challenged. And I can say that I was able to, uh, you know, sustain uh, in that particular uh, domain, I was able to relate to them and they were able to engage with me is only because of, you know, the qualitative dimensions that I was looking into the product, but not looking at it purely as a commercial enterprise. In fact, my company subsidized it enormously. And uh, as a part of my company, CSR, uh, we started distributing that software for 10 years. And uh, uh, that particular organization gave us the right to distribute it. So only the postal charges was was uh, 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 charged by us. Uh, they were charged by us, but otherwise the software was freely available for a very long time. Today you have smartphones. Today you have technologies which are much more sophisticated. And uh, but when I started doing it. Uh, I mean, we hardly had anything except a keyboard and mouse and uh, a Windows uh, 3.1 computer where our software was still being loaded through floppy disks. And I'm sure most of the people on this uh, Zoom meeting don't even know what a floppy disk is, but uh, that's how it all started. And uh, it didn't end there. And we, uh, I was asked to make uh, uh, the training the trainers videos for uh, this particular organization. But uh, I had a challenge. The challenge is that uh, people with intellectual disabilities, unlike, you know, in other corporate and documentary filmmaking ecosystem, they do not do what you want them to do. You need to capture things when they do it. You need to relate to them. You need to empathize with them. You need to be in their shoes to understand, uh, you know, their world. And uh, I was given the task of capturing, uh, you know, those uh, uh, challenges, uh, which will serve as a training module or which will serve uh, as a kind of uh, 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 documentation, visual documentation that will probably help other trainers who are working with uh, uh, children who are uh, intellectually challenged. Where did I learn that patience? Where did I learn that kind of an empathy? And uh, where did I learn the dichotomy between the ethic and the emic? It's again anthropology.
I mean, to be honest, uh, uh, we filmmakers are a little rude. Uh, our technicians are pretty rude. We don't have uh, much of patience in uh, uh, other domains like corporate filmmaking because our meters will be running. Our equipment, sophisticated equipment will be on hire. Our camera persons and technicians will charge per call sheet. But here is a challenge where I need to have a team, uh, you know, which is uh, a, a patient and which is empathetic to the people and wait for the shot to be ready. It's not like, you know, I go in as a director uh, and take the shot when the assistant comes and tells me everything is ready. No way. So we have to wait for an opportunity uh, for the people because it's a real live training that we are trying to document on the uh, video. And that should be a benchmark shot because that will be used as a benchmark training by some other person in the country tomorrow. So it required a lot of patience. So I had to sit and groom a team of technicians, including my camera persons, and uh, you know tell them about the importance of doing the project and uh, make them understand, you know, the importance of human communication. And they stuck with me uh, because I did a lot of films for uh, this organization subsequently. Most of them I have done it more because of the passion. But that's where I realized that, uh, you know, there's a lot that anthropology can teach us because the qualitative dimensions, looking at you know, the, the things which are normally not visible to the naked eye is something that only anthropology helped me uh, uh, understand. And I chose anthropology to be with me. Uh, I chose my training to be with me. And that is the reason why I consciously was using it in my profession. It didn't end there. Uh, uh, thanks to my association with this organization, I was introduced uh, to uh, uh, the uh, Helen Keller Foundation. Uh, it's called the Hilton Perkins School for Deaf and the Deaf Blind. Uh, the headquarters is in Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, those people got to see my uh, films that I have made for the intellectually challenged. And they said, they asked me whether I am willing to make a training of the trainers film for the deaf and the deaf blind. And these are the children who were congenitally deaf and deaf, uh, congenitally deaf blind. I mean, uh, that means these are the people who haven't had an opportunity to hear a single sound and see a single thing ever since they were born. And there is this wonderful organization in Bombay, Mumbai today, uh, which was involved in empowering these uh, children and, uh, uh, you know, providing them with all the kind of handholding and training that they require so that they can lead uh, independent lives once they grow up. And uh, I went to Bombay, did a Reiki, and uh, uh, I came back, I sat with my team, and I told them that it's not an easy exercise because this is training of the trainers. The quality of the product should be really good. And it's an international organization that is involved in it. And uh, who are the people I'm dealing with? Someone with whom I cannot communicate uh, because they are deaf. Someone who cannot see me because they are visually uh, challenged. And when I went there and saw the way in which the people were communicating. They had their own sign language for the ones who had uh, vision and they had this touch which they were using as a medium of communication to interact with those uh, uh, people. And it was uh, in every way a life-changing experience for me. Uh, went with an entourage of uh, uh, eight or nine team members from Hyderabad. I could have hired the local technicians from Bombay because it is the filmmaking capital of India, but I didn't. 
I chose to take my own team who were working with me in NIMH because they have been trained to some extent to work with, uh, you know, the people who are not as abled as you and me. So I took them and uh, it was pretty long. Uh, it was almost about 15 or 16 days of stay. And uh, the first one week, uh, we just went to see the environment, the way in which people communicate. We had to understand the requirement. We need to actually be with them, live with them to understand what it means to be them. Because this particular film was meant to showcase, uh, you know, their challenges and world to the rest of the people and also to the prospective trainers. And uh, it wasn't easy, but we were able to do it. And the reason why I can tell you, the reason why, you know, I was able to do it, I was able to script and I was able to sit with the team members and understand their requirements and subsequently was able to deliver the product is only because of my training in anthropology. I'm sure uh, you understand uh, what I'm uh, talking about. Under the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the importance of, uh, you know, the human communication, the importance of looking at the world from the people's perspective once again, and, you know, uh, is something that uh, re enormously helped me have that kind of patience, the same kind of patience and that same kind of probably the empathy we don't have in a corporate environment. Uh, but we were able to do it is only because uh, I happen to be a student of anthropology. So it was always uh, a new opportunity, a new window uh, that used to be open for me. And I used to grab it is only because it was something I was sure, I was confident that I could deliver is not because I am a filmmaker, but because I'm a student of anthropology. Filmmaking is something everybody will do. You need to hire a creative person who can write a copy. You will have somebody who will give you the inputs as far as what the company requires. You need a, a very good cameraman. If you, if you are able to afford, you will have the best cameraman in the world in our own country and you can hire the best of equipment. But the ones that, per, you know, personally challenged me, the ones that actually beckoned me are the ones that requires, you know, the kind of an understanding that only a student of anthropology can. I used to go and plunge into those kind of projects. I had my partner who used to handle the corporate domain to great extent, but I used to embrace the development communication and uh, multilateral agencies like even World Bank, we did a project. Uh, they did a field research in Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and they came to Delhi and in India, they came to us and I made uh, the films for them based on the footages is only because I was able to relate to them, sit across the table with the clients and able to understand and speak the language that those people uh, are speaking. If I was any other uh, filmmaker, I would have done a cut and paste job and it would have gone through uh, 10 or 20 iterations and it would have been any other kind of an experience. But I was able to add value to the films. I was able to add value to the company or I was able to add value to a development project is only because of my training in anthropology. And that is what, uh, that is how anthropology helped me. And it, 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 I mean, it, it, it actually helped me gain enormous respect, I should say, in the domain of filmmaking. And for some uh, strange reason, uh, uh, you know, my uh, organization and I personally, but only involved in corporate films and in uh, films in the domain of development communication. We never ventured into commercial filmmaking. We never did anything for a television serial. We provided some back-end back support and some post-production support, but uh, we never ventured into it is because the kind of the satisfaction 
that anything that is intellectually challenging gives you is something that not this uh, other domains give. Not that they are easy to make. It also requires a lot of effort. Uh, but that's how anthropology was able to add a lot of value. I was able to add a lot of value to my clients is only because of my training and grounding in anthropology and thanks to all my gurus. And uh, there are many instances like this. I was once uh, invited uh, by the government of Goa and uh, I was making uh, uh, corporate films and uh, uh, I was approached by no less uh, uh, than uh, somebody higher up in Goa, government of Goa. And uh, the late Mr. Manohar Parikkar was the chief minister then, long time back, the first time. I'm talking about, uh, I think, 2007 or 2008. And uh, uh, he was the chief minister. And uh, they said there is a need for a film. And uh, I was heavily into making films for IT companies. For some strange reason, uh, uh, IT companies used to approach us, Microsoft, Google, Deloitte, GE. Satyam was my biggest client. I must have made at least about 2000 films for Satyam alone. And uh, I had a dedicated team for Satyam. And uh, we were making films for all their verticals across the world. Uh, uh, from here in Hyderabad, we had an FTP line with them. And uh, every presentation across the world, uh, you know, the presentation used to be uploaded by us. We used to make it here. Their corporate communications used to be in my uh, studio. And uh, it was a beautiful experience and a wonderful uh, uh, exposure to the IT world, thanks to Satyam Computers those days. So since uh, uh, I think it was the word of mouth and also through somebody else, uh, uh, you know, through a classmate of uh, uh, late Sri Manohar Parikka, uh, I was uh, uh, given uh, an audience with the chief minister and I thought I was making a film on uh, something to do with IT. But the challenge that was thrown at us was that uh, they would like to brand Goa as the IT destination of India. I mean, I said, seriously, Goa is fun. Goa is holiday. Uh, I mean, today Goa is casino and Goa is beaches, uh, but uh, uh, way back, uh, I mean, those days, uh, Goa was planning an international conference for uh, IT professionals, and uh, Goa is known for another thing every year, the films, uh, I think something to do with the films, uh, uh, the commercial and documentary cinema happens, the international film festival happens in Goa. So that was a wonderful experience again. But how do we brand Goa as a business destination? And that again, I had to pull out my anthropology hat. And uh, I, I had done a lot of uh, research. You know, one thing anthropology taught me is to ask the right questions. Uh, that's very important, especially in business. Uh, and especially when you're negotiating with the client or when you're negotiating with anybody else. Uh, you need to know what questions to ask. And I probably that's what I think I learned. And uh, I had to, uh, you know, really understand the Govan culture uh, from their, uh, from a business point of view. I mean, it's very easy to sell Goa as a tourist destination, but it was extremely challenging to sell Goa as a business destination. And uh, we have to capture the tourist spots, obviously, because that come in uh, as a value addition to whoever who wants to invest in Goa. It's easier to showcase the beaches and tell them come to Goa. And this is the best place to be. Uh, but to show Govan culture, uh, you know, Goa was also one of the most literate states in India, even today. And uh, uh, they have a very long history. And uh, behind every wonderful holiday, that all of us have in Goa, there are hardworking Govans in the background, you know, who probably are making our experiences beautiful. So I, we had to capture that aspect of Goa, that dimension of Goa, apart from the investment, apart from the infrastructure, 
and then we came out with this uh, wonderful theme that uh, Goa 365 days on a holiday. So Goa has everything to offer from palm trees to palm tops. Those days we didn't have smartphones, but we had palm tops, which was a gadget that we used to use to scribble something digitally. And uh, we made a film and that was very well received. And uh, uh, I mean, it was again, uh, something that uh, I would attribute to my grounding and training. I, 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 I sat with some people who, 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 who are from the Portuguese descent. Uh, we had to showcase some of those Portuguese dimensions of the Govan culture, which is an integral part of Govan culture and uh, was uh, uh, totally uh, immersed in that project is only because I was more uh, uh, involving myself as a, a student of culture, as a student of, uh, you know, uh, that particular aspect of uh, human uh, uh, living, the dimension of human living that Goa had to offer. That was another one. And then uh, because of my uh, uh, involvement with Satyam on the corporate side, uh, I was invited uh, to, uh, you know, look at their CSR. And uh, I remember going uh, to somewhere in the outskirts of Hyderabad uh, in a small room. Uh, you know, uh, I had my first uh, interaction with the people who were ideating on one of uh, India's largest, uh, you know, foundations uh, that was subsequently coming up. And it was uh, called the Bairaju Foundation. And uh, Bairaju Foundation had a fantastic footprint in Andhra, uh, the, those days, the uh, combined state of uh, Andhra Pradesh. And I remember it started in a small way. Uh, and Bairaju Foundation was into multiple verticals. They were planning to go into multiple verticals of uh, sanitation, health, water, pure drinking water, environment. And uh, I was invited uh, as a filmmaker but I did not remain as a filmmaker. Uh, in fact, they stopped looking at me as a, a filmmaker and, a, uh, and somebody who delivers films. I was able to, uh, you know, involve myself uh, uh, at a much more organic level with Bairaju Foundation. I had a, a, a opportunity to meet some of the best brains in the country who were uh, working for or working with Bairaju Foundation. And I had an opportunity to visit so many villages in the process of capturing all of them visually, but we wanted to do something different. Uh, if you look at uh, those days, if you look at most of the films made by NGOs or made by the CSR wings of the corporates, it was like a monologue. They used to show some visuals. There used to be a voiceover. And they used to be, uh, uh, it's a regular film like any other corporate film. But one, the challenge was that, and one of the propositions we made is, instead of we telling what we have done, why don't we make the stakeholders speak what, uh, uh, what the foundation has done to them? So that's how I brought in the value addition uh, to the table. I brought in those propositions to the table is because a story is well said when it is well told. A story is well told when it is told by the person who is a stakeholder rather than we scripting a success story and showcasing it visually. Why don't we just make the stakeholders speak out for themselves? And uh, that led to a very long experience with Bairaju Foundation. And uh, it's one of uh, uh, the experiences I still cherish. Uh, and my involvement at the grassroots level, trying to talk to the stakeholders and engage with them and understand the kind of value addition or the kind of uh, you know, uh, 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 value enhancement that has happened because of the work of Bairaju Foundation in their lives, uh, you know, helped me script the story and uh, showcase it to 
uh, by Raju Foundation's uh, people, they showcase those films to everybody else in the world. British Petroleum, uh, you know, partnered with them and many other major multinational corporations partnered with by Raju and a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, work happened in that context. And I owe, uh, you know, uh, my involvement in that uh, uh, organization, not I mean, purely to anthropology, not to my filmmaking skills. It's not me who's making the film there. It's the technicians who make it. But uh, it's just that story, the way it is told, is something I was able to do so, is again, only because thanks to uh, anthropology. Uh, I remember, I think uh, my gurus should uh, pardon me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think it was Malinowski, isn't it, sir? who said corpus inscriptionum, like uh, narrate the story uh, in the way, uh, in the original language, uh, if I'm right. And uh, that's something that I learned from anthropology. Uh, a voiceover artist can really give a very good uh, uh, narrative, a narration to the film. But if it is told from a stakeholder's point of view, uh, it's it's not just realistic, it is true. It's the truth that's being captured on the canvas of a film. And uh, that's again, anthropology. And it continued like that. And uh, uh, subsequently, uh, I was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm engaged even today, I'm engaged with uh, uh, the uh, Department of Urban Governance and Capacity Building uh, done a lot of work uh, in the domain of uh, urban governance. Uh, we have worked in many areas, but one experience I would like to narrate. Uh, there was one film, thanks to ASCII, I was involved in. Uh, there, there used to be a program uh, called Andhra Pradesh Urban Services for the Poor. This was sponsored by DFID UK. And uh, they did a program for the urban poor in a municipality called Kutbulapur in Hyderabad. And uh, uh, that particular program, uh, the project is all about participatory development. I was asked to showcase that uh, project, but uh, when I was uh, involved in it, uh, I can thoroughly understand the nuances of that project is only because of uh, you know, my exposure to participatory development. And that was when I, on the ground, I could see how participatory development can actually succeed. Uh, you know, in this Kutbulapur municipality, uh, uh, I'll just put it in a nutshell. Uh, I have seen it practically, what I have read it in a textbook, where, you know, when the stakeholders are engaged in the development program, you know, the sense of asset ownership is very high. And, you know, normally we have this attitude towards public assets, uh, for some strange reason, most of us feel that the public assets are not our assets. Even though the Constitution of India says we the people, and it is us who are the sovereign power, uh, most of us don't feel that something that is owned by the government is ours. And that stakeholders, uh, uh, you know, when they are engaged in planning, normally what happens is, Development programs are implemented by the government, imposed and thrust upon the people, and they are asked to actually bear, I mean, uh, uh, partake from the fruits of that development. But most of the time we see that the assets deteriorate. There are dis they are always in a state of disuse, disrepair, is mainly because people never feel that it belongs to them. It's their asset. But uh, this particular uh, experience of mine, uh, when I was involved to document it visually, I saw, uh, I mean, when people are actually made the stakeholder, they were asked to plan. There are three levels, if I vaguely remember, sir, it's more than one and a half decades, uh, or almost two decades. But uh, there are three levels of uh, uh, the project, C1, C2, and C3, I think. At the C1 level, the slum, uh, because this is urban poor, so we are talking about slums, urban slums. And uh, the people uh, are asked to make a plan. They are supposed to come out with their own blueprint about what they want in those specific domains. 
especially women are asked to engage more. That's another way of empowering women. And they are the ones who will continue to protect the assets for a long time. And uh, one of the project guidelines is if you engage women, uh, the project will become sustainable, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I have seen it that, uh, you know, when they come out with their own projects, they came out with their own blueprint, uh, it will be, uh, you know, kind of uh, made into, I mean, it will be trimmed, uh, projectized, funding will be done, implemented, and the asset is transferred to the people. I remember, uh, uh, you know, we have this PSP, public stand post, which are the public taps. So you government comes and digs a bore well uh, for the people. Nobody will be bothered if it is leaking. Uh, the taps will be flowing. Probably the taps will be stolen and the water will be leaking. But when you ask the people to come out with the need, make them implement it and uh, ask them to take care of it and meter it, charge them for that, they will start protecting the assets uh, more carefully. And that's participatory development. I mean, the sustainability of the project, the, uh, you know, the capacity building, the project uh, incorporated as a part of its uh, uh, the program have really helped. And it's only because I happen to be a student of anthropology, I was able to understand the components of that project. And since I was able to understand the components of the project and the way they will subsequently manifest themselves over a period of time, I was able to make a documentary on it. And that's again where you see uh, the training in anthropology has enormously helped. And uh, we, uh, I, I had an opportunity to work, uh, develop the communication blueprint. I was a part of the team that made the communication blueprint to roll out 24 seven water supply. So we had to do field work, uh, stakeholder engagement in two areas. We chose Rajamandri, which had abundance of water. And we chose Nalgonda, where the groundwater is completely polluted by uh, fluoride, fluorosis and other problems. And uh, uh, I was engaged in that, uh, uh, developing that communication blueprint and uh, uh, behavior change communication. That's another area where uh, uh, I find myself very comfortable is only because of our understanding of the human mind and our understanding of the human culture. So there are enormous areas, I mean, enormous, uh, uh, I mean, I just can't list, there are so many places. And then uh, uh, I had to do, uh, I, I did two, uh, I would say quasi ethnographic or semi ethnographic uh, studies. Uh, one was I was a part of the team uh, that was asked to make a document on making Tirupati a heritage circuit. Normally people go to Tirupati only to visit uh, uh, Lord Venkateshwara on the hills and they go from the airport, you know, uh, do their, their, take their darshan and go back. But uh, uh, the then member of the parliament, uh, he wanted to actually, he had a vision to develop the, uh, Tirupati as a heritage circuit. So people who come to Tirupati should uh, have, uh, uh, you know, uh, they should tour in and around the places. There are so many wonderful places around Tirupati. Some of them are archaeologically very, very significant. And uh, not just the temple, but there are many other places which are significant when it comes to India's proto history also. So uh, I was a part of the team and, uh, and the domain that I was taking care of is to capture those uh, uh, important places. So I was asked, uh, I was tasked with the responsibility to identify the places and make a brief ethnographic note. Or if I can, if I'm allowed to use the word, I think I'm using it a little loosely, but uh, to develop a note on the relevance of that place from a historical point of view. So uh, I had about six or seven apprentices who were working. I trained them, asked them to go and capture the initial uh, uh, data. And then I went and we did field work. And uh, that was when, again, anthropology came to my rescue is because uh, the data that I required 
to shortlist a particular place was its historical significance, archaeological significance, and also I had to depend in some places on oral culture and oral traditions because there were no written uh, books available. Wherever it was possible, I used to get in touch with one uh, 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 gentleman uh, who is probably, uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable enough to share information. And in some places of religious importance, I spoke to the priests, sat down with them and also the people and captured the mythological, historical and in some places archaeological importance. I'm sure some of you, sir, I think I'm sure you must have heard about this place called Gudimallam. It is one of uh, one of the proto historic sites uh, in India, one of the oldest in India. We, we always learned about the phallus worship uh, in proto historic periods. And this is one of those uh, uh, places where you can see uh, 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 the, the concept of phallus worship. It was not even technically uh, Shivalinga. I mean, it's there now in the public domain. You can research it. I mean, awe inspiring when you go into the historical roots of India and its great civilization. So uh, that is when uh, I felt that uh, uh, thanks to my training in anthropology, I was able to add a lot of value to that document. We made a big document, I think uh, hundreds of pages. And subsequently, I believe uh, it was submitted to the then planning commission. And it's a 1200 crore project report that we made. Uh, it had multiple dimensions and I was taking care of the anthropological part of it. And I was able to be the part of the team is only because of my training in anthropology. So I was able to do all this is only because of me being an anthropologist, not because I'm a filmmaker, not because I have a studio or not because I know how to make films. I'm able to, I, I survived the competition. I, I could carve out a niche for myself, a small niche for myself is only because uh, of my training in anthropology. And subsequently recession stuck post 2006 and seven and corporate films uh, is no more uh, uh, the bread and butter. Most of the corporates stopped investing in new ventures. So whenever they have a, a marketing pitch, they need a film. But when they were not able to sustain their existing business, leave alone uh, making pitch for new business, the demand for corporate films came down. And uh, subsequently, I, uh, you know, moved into uh you know spending more of my time in teaching and uh, uh authoring uh, uh text material for the civil service aspirants and uh and then one last thing that we wanted to do before we formally closed my uh setup uh the company is alive we are still freelancing uh and that was my uh my partners asked me uh, for 20 years, we have been doing films. We have done thousands of them. And they said, why don't you make one film in anthropology? And uh, uh, as uh, God willed it, uh, there was a call invitation uh, from independent producers and directors to submit concepts uh, and uh, films division. Uh, I happen, I'm a, I love road trips. So every year, uh, you know, a few of my friends, we every year we keep going on road trips. And one of the circuits we do very often is the Kudre Muk range in Karnataka, Dakshina Kannada. And uh, I had a student and a very dear friend of mine who is from Kurk. He is a, he is a Kodava. And uh, he, is a, uh, he is now a very senior uh, most uh, vice president in one of the big multinational companies. And uh, thanks to him, I have had uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say, a, uh, int I developed a lot of interest in the Kodava culture. And uh, I thought, why not actually make uh, the visual ethnography on Kodavas? Because uh, uh, I have been marrying my two expertises as a filmmaker and anthropology, but anthropology was more in the back end. And people don't know that there's a lot of anthropology 
that goes into writing those scripts and making those uh, uh, you know suggestions and propositions to the clients but i wanted to make something obviously anthropological and uh, thankfully my concept note was accepted i was asked to make a documentary by the films division of india and uh, i again wore my anthropology hat and uh, i spent a long time with the kodavas the kodavas are the ethnic uh, community of kurg and uh, uh, shiva prasad sir ramesh srinivas kurg society i am in uh, uh, of south india and uh, i stayed with them i i, I went on an initial uh, recce uh, for almost 10 15 days uh, met with the people try to understand their culture came back uh, developed the concept note submitted to the films division and post it got accepted i went back and uh, i started uh, capturing the kodava culture on cam- camera and that's when i realized that uh, the kodava culture this ethnic group their culture their et- original uh, uh, culture to some extent was being overwhelmed by more popular kannada culture so there had been some amount of uh, change in their culture but the original uh, ethnic uh, and uh, i would say uh, the genuine kodava culture was what i was looking for and uh, uh, there was a small group of people who were actually leading the uh, movement uh, for uh, uh, a separate state or at least accepting their language which is called kodava tak as one of the official languages of india so i happened to interact with their uh, uh, the leaders and they exposed me to the uh, the original culture of kodavas i spoke to a lot of uh, uh, educated people uh, i mean people who had enormous uh, knowledge about the origin and history of kodavas and i followed the protocol of anthropology and uh, came out with the documentary the documentary was very short but the amount of data that i have collected is because i am obsessively compulsively an anthropologist at that time enormous amount of data i collected and uh, i am actually way, uh, planning to write uh, a small monograph if possible uh, one day uh, based on that knowledge so learned a lot understood the dynamics of uh, 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 cultural diffusion while being there and how acculturation affects uh, certain indigenous groups and how the politics of a popular culture and uh, a culture that is not so popular interact and how it will manifest into an ethnic or ethno political uh, issue is something that i was able to uh, see experience and document i the political part obviously is the not not the part of the documentary the documentary was only about kodava culture but uh, you can see the undercurrents of uh, that cultural approximation it was an abrupt uh, juxtaposition between these two cultures that is very palpable sir and uh, that's something that i was able to witness so there are many experiences like this and uh, uh, one of recently i would say recently 5 years ago when the new state of andhra pradesh was carved uh, i had the honor of showcasing andhra pradesh to uh, uh, foreign uh, investors so i was tasked with the responsibility to showcase andhra pradesh it's a new state there was hardly any infrastructure at the time so i i made films in foreign languages uh, for satyam i made films in german in french and uh, for andhra pradesh i made films in mandarin and uh, cantonese and uh, japanese and uh, right from like for example when you make a film for uh, the japanese viewers uh, you should make sure that uh, things are not loud uh, you should make sure that even the background music is not very loud i mean this this kind of a cultural empathy is something that only anthropology can teach us 
and uh, respecting the cultural boundaries is something anthropology teaches us. So, uh, so there's so many experiences that I have had uh, in anthropology. And finally, uh, I'm also a Rotarian. I was, uh, I'm passionate uh, towards, uh, you know, social work. Uh, so I thought I should uh, associate with an organization which can add value to whatever little I want to do. So I found Rotary International to be very credible. One of the, I mean, in fact, it is the world's largest uh, NGO and uh, it does tremendous amount of work. I was attracted to its pulse polio and uh, various other programs, especially health, because uh, uh, I did my field work in medical anthropology. I think I was one of the first to have uh, uh, experimented with that. Sharma sir was my guide there. Shiva Prasad sir and Venkat Rao sir were there with me in the field work. And uh, ethnomedical practices is what I have done. And uh, and I was able to uh, uh, you know bring in a lot of my insight in anthropology to the service projects in my own club in Rotary. And uh, today I'm uh, part of the sanitation mission. And my experience with ASCII, my uh, work with uh, Administrative Staff College of India uh, in Swachh Bharat uh, Abhiyan. Uh, I have we have made the films for Sarva uh, Swachh Vidyalaya Puraskar for three years, and we are, I was also the part of the team that made the uh, training module for Swachh Sarvekshan that happens in municipal corporations for GHMC and in some of the municipalities in Andhra Pradesh. So it's a learning. It's a it's a very long learning curve. It's every day is a new experience and a learning experience. So that to some extent, uh, I would say, uh, is what, that's how anthropology helped. But the question is, it was, uh, I mean, I mean, how is it that I was able to find anthropology in whatever I do? At the end of the day, it was my choice. I mean, I was a student of biology. I was a student of chemistry in my graduation. I mean, all of us have been students of one subject or the other. But the, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's left to us to, you know, explore whatever academic knowledge you have in your everyday practical day to day goings on. Whether it's your personal life, the way you look at the world, the way you consume information coming to you, uh, you know, the way you look at the things happening around you. And the way you groom, uh, you know, the people around you, the children and everybody else is a matter of your choice. I chose it. I, I wanted to make sure that uh, anthropology is the part and parcel of everything I do. There's so much to learn from this discipline. I mean, uh, it is one thing that, uh, you know, helps you. I have so many of my students who are uh, in civil services. And uh, I do occasionally have some of them coming back and telling me that uh, something that they learned in anthropology class is actually helping me, helping them in some practical solution while they are working on the field as an officer of the Indian Administrative Service. Uh, we have our own Vijay Lakshmi and Geeta who are in civil servants who are PhDs in anthropology and I'm sure as officers of Indian Administrative Service, I'm sure they must be adding a lot of value to whatever they do. Kalyan, I think, is in Chhattisgarh, right, sir? He's an IP, is an officer, IPS officer, and I'm sure he is, uh, you know, looking at uh, his profession and his interfacing with the people as a police officer is, uh, uh, you know, very different. Uh, from someone who is not trained in anthropology. So it's a matter of choice. And uh, that's where it is. I always believe that uh, anthropology adds uh, that, uh, I mean, it's a word probably not there in English. Uh, we, have, we use the word ambidextrous uh, for somebody who uses both the hands equally good. Sabhyasachi in Sanskrit. But uh, I think anthropology 
makes us polydextrous in our thinking. Uh, it makes us look at the things in a 360 degree perspective. It makes us touch the intangible, see the invisible. And we have been taught, we have been taught in a research methodology uh, that we need to remove those layers that exist and try and delve deep into the human cultures to realize what the reality is. We are the ones who can make uh, 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 the dichotomy between perception and reality. And anthropology, I think, is one discipline and the only discipline that I know that can actually help us unravel the mysteries of human mind and the mysteries of human action, especially. Tell me a domain where anthropology is not relevant, especially today. You open the newspaper, switch on a television channel, watch a documentary or even go to the cinema, you see anthropology there. You know, uh, politics, media. When you look at the quality of journalism, there's so much that we as anthropologists can offer to journalism. We can make it much more humanist, humanistic. We can add a lot of value to the quality of journalism that is that can happen in our country. And... Uh, Look at businesses. Bhaskara was speaking. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. In fact, after his presentation, I was very nervous to give mine today because the quality of his presentation is top class. And uh, uh, in businesses, Sriram was exploring business anthropology. Sir Shubhaprasad sir was talking about how we uh, want to add value to business uh, ecosystems, human rights. I mean, uh, visual anthropology, filmmakers, there's so many uh, people who would like to, you know, test the waters of filmmaking. And uh, there's so many students uh, from our own universities, MassCom, who used to come to me uh, for apprenticeship, or they used to make use of my uh, uh, post-production facilities those days. And uh, uh, the quality of a production, the quality of storytelling, is uh, uh, so different, you know, when we when you have that little anthropological insight into understanding the human mind and the human perception. And I'm sure uh, anthropology can add a lot of value. Today in our alumni group, it, uh, there was an article on the relevance of anthropology in COVID. Uh, I mean, uh, I wrote a small amateurish blog also uh, I share it with the community members uh, here. And uh, you see that there's so much of anthropological relevance. I mean, we talk about social epidemiology. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle variable in uh, the spread of infections. And I think uh, 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 there is no uh, better uh, 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 opportunity to understand the relevance of uh, anthropology uh, in epidemic uh, and pandemic situations than today. I think most for all of us, this is the first time we are witnessing a pandemic of this order. And uh, anthropology has a lot of relevance and I'm so happy to see that there's aggressive uh, research going on in this domain. But uh, if you, I have a very humble submission search to Anthropos Foundation. You're doing beautiful work, Dr. Sunita and team. And uh, I would, uh, I, I think that if we can, as anthropologists, all the people come together, all the stalwarts in anthropology, we are all involved in uh, uh, research uh, and uh, uh, the academic training in anthropology if we can make small modules, if you people can think of small modules in anthropology, which can be multidisciplinary, uh, you know, which can be consumed right from high school, you know, it will change a lot because there's a lot we need to teach our children, the younger generations, when it comes to our culture, our society, gender, uh, you know, and a lot of things. And I'm sure, very sure, that we can add a lot of value to the quality of uh, the socialization that our children get if we can bring in the anthropological insight into it. It should be so generic 
that it can be consumed by people of all the domains, even a parent, a, you know, a journalist, a businessman, you know, a practicing doctor or anybody else. You can think of those modules, small modules like Anthropology 101 or Anthropology, uh, I don't want to use the word dummies, but Anthropology for popular consumption. And uh, in that way, I think Anthropology will not only gain the significance that it has, unfortunately, which is not known, but we will be doing a lot to this society, this country and our culture. And to the, as humans, we will be uh, witnessing a kind of a change in our attitude towards the rest of the people around us. Because anthropology inherently teaches us, uh, uh, you know, the cultural relativism. It teaches us uh, the kind of empathy one requires when dealing with diversity. Cult anthropology teaches us to shed our biases. And anthropology is something that teaches us to be culturally sensitive. And I think there is no better place than India to celebrate diversity. And I'm sure uh, anthropology has a lot to offer. And I think uh, the small concepts starting from high school will enormously help. I remember Sharma sir was sharing something from Kerala, uh, a small textbook for high school students. And I think, uh, there should be an advocacy to have anthropology as a part and parcel of high school curriculum. It need not be theoretical, but it could be some simple concepts of how we can interpret the world around us. And those small anthropological concepts will go a long way in impacting the personality of the people or personality of our children. Because I, I, I personally feel that anthropology is a way of life and uh, it, it, it's a matter of choice uh, how you want to consume it and how you want to take it. So I think we should make anthropology more omnipresent. Uh, it is omnipotent for sure. Uh, it's all powerful for sure. And it should be omnipresent. It should be there in the domains which it is not present today. And I think all of us should shoulder the responsibility of making it popular. And Anthropos Foundation, I'm sure, has its task, uh, you know, cut out for itself. And uh, I'm willing to help you uh, if you want to make any presentations online and uh, uh, with academic uh, uh, orientation and in simple language, if we can make anthropology popular, I'm sure it will add a lot of value to the people. We need to create, uh, uh, you know, explore the niche anthropology can have in all those domains. So it should be made elective in all the universities, sir. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why an engineering student shouldn't study anthropology. A small anthropological, uh, maybe, uh, a 10 day or a 15 day course because somewhere down the line uh, they have to interface with humans so so many ideas uh, and i think i'm sure we can uh, make it work and thank you so much i'm really honored uh, uh, to address you all and all my gurus there and uh, i am what i am because of you and because of this discipline anthropology Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Sunita. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, I think uh, it is a, uh, uh, it's a long journey and uh, quite uh, informative to a lot of youngsters. Uh, and uh, in fact, I remember, uh, you know, very well when I first joined the University of Hyderabad, uh, you know, he was bragging the juniors. He went to their class and and told them that he is Professor he is Dr. Sivu Prasad and he is, he is his new teacher. He came and that told was, me that was ra <laughs> that was ragging, sir. Yeah, yeah, but he came and told me, sir, they they will be surprised if you go. Don't uh, 
uh, tell i'm just kidding that but the idea is that his even when he was trying to do it he was doing it more academically see what my uh, this thing is raggings are generally done in a very uh, harsh way but this is something uh, you know because he's quite informed but my uh, this thing is in fact the kind of experience that you have what is it that you think that uh, you know it can be brought back to the disciplinary boundaries in terms of the uh, additional things that we can be added to uh, the, the curricula or added to the kind of writings because that will be useful for example uh, you know the the way in which uh, we because internships are one but internships are alone are not enough so when you bring back those experiences into the main field of anthropology i think that will uh, add value to the discipline and also add further uh, some kind of practical kind of uh, way out to look at things because in a classical anthropological sense it doesn't work so we need those kinds of uh, things i'm sure that you will be able to write it up when you uh, you know elaborately work on this and i think yes. it's also a good idea that uh, you know to make popular uh, kind of uh, small documentaries or small snippets for uh, uh, different uh, uh, you know uh, people in fact i remember uh my guru used to tell that we all should write in the newspapers and in vernacular so that a lot of people who read in you know, a simple kind of a this thing that's one way we could do it and also make small uh, uh, maybe with some kind of a humor and other things also to appeal to people you know in uh, smaller uh, visuals and other kinds of things that we can make And, and also, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. sir. I think also we need, uh, uh, we should make. I mean, uh, uh, people like Anthropos Foundation and academicians should uh, also tackle the kind of misinformation yeah. and yeah. wrong knowledge that's 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 being imparted everywhere around us. I I, I think uh, the courage of conviction uh, is something that only anthropologists have to. We'll put the facts uh, across the table yeah in fact uh, uh, i'm into a kind of project which is uh, information for all program of unesco where we talk about this uh, you know uh, fake news and uh, miscommunication and all these kind of things how uh, one can arrest them and what kind of ways in fact a lot of multilingual teams and more of anthropological bent of mind is there But it's a good idea because I think uh, maybe we can uh, have a uh, you know different uh, discussion on this and work on something on that. And it is a good uh, uh, thing to tell people, especially a lot of youngsters. I still see quite a few are asking uh, to you know when you make uh, any kind of documentary, how sensitive one has to be, and that's what you brought it out. And they, uh, I think. Uh, Uh, i will leave it to uh, others to talk and i think i will leave it i will give back to uh, sunita to uh, yes thank you thank you sir so much thank you for accepting so thank you so thank much you, sir. sir my honor really thank you uh, kartik it was wonderful listening to you and most of our listeners have already written about very inspiring informative lecture and they got encouraged and many of them actually wants to see some of your films if you can say where we can look for yes help and uh, uh, yeah. i'll compile a playlist and i'll share it with you which you can share it with everybody in the group very good thank you so much that's great thank you and there one or two questions i think we can quickly answer that one of the question is about uh, navin narayan from jaipur uh, he yeah. is uh how narration can establish as fact working with roaming communities no historical data or studies are available so communities old persons can share their issues so how do we see this information coming from like what you said about oral histories also so how how we can establish it as a fact 
uh, establish it as a fact i need to we need to definitely cross check if i understand the question very right correctly how narration can establish as fact no it won't but you need to cross check it from multiple sources and uh, in my case let me tell you that uh, for, for some, some strange reason from my childhood i have taken an interest in towards uh, in sanskrit so i learned sanskrit also only to understand certain aspects of uh, the indian culture so when i was doing that specific research the edited circuit i had to fall back on certain historical documents i came to a sanskrit college in hyderabad i showed them those documents and those professors were helping me in trying to uh, interpret whatever was written about those things so you just cannot take every narration at the face value but you need to cross check the veracity of the information uh if i understood your question very right navin uh that's what it is and especially when anything is going into the public consumption and in the public domain uh as academicians we have to be very very responsible because we are the last uh, uh i would say uh the i mean uh, we are the final court of appeal when it comes to the veracity of fact especially when it comes to uh anthropological uh domain insights so we need to really cross check the veracity before we publish it historical data when it is not available i think shiva prasad sir is uh, you are more qualified and dr sunita uh, when historical data is not available oral culture and oral fact uh, so you will be cross checking it with other sources sir secondary sources of data no basically uh, the oral cultures are passed on and their new things are added to them uh, generally we take them in the absence of uh, any other literature because most of the indigenous communities do not have written cultures so in that kind of a context we have to take on the face value of their version we are only trying to what we have been saying not uh, uh, what we wanted to say exactly so that is where that is where the, we are trying to, the oral uh, history is accepted even in history oral traditions are important because they project a lot of information and uh, they may have wider angles to that so oral histories are not fake because they are they are histories in one sense in fact what anthropologists do is when we do field work we record those oral histories that will become a historical document for future generations so that's how it is i don't think uh, uh, there is any uh, kind of apology yeah. about it correct and we anthropologists never put our perspective it's always we are more translators we are more mediators so we only uh try to put the perspective of the people we study and the cultures we study to the people across i think at end of the day the interpretation is left to the reader and in our case in visual ethnography it is left to the viewer so uh, i 